Hey guys, thanks for stopping by. This video was recorded a little bit ago, so some of the specific information is a little dated, but the general topic of using Panasonic cameras for wedding videos is still super relevant. So good luck shooting weddings in 2023 and enjoy this episode of Micro Four Talks. Hello everybody, my name is Rhett Thompson. Welcome back to the Micro Four Talks, if you will. I guess we're sticking with that name, a uh, podcast video series thing. Um, I guess I should probably explain what I'm trying to do and what this series is, which is basically just finding content creators and professionals who use Micro Four Thirds gear as their primary cameras or at least a big part of their production and just sit down, talk with them, uh, mostly for my own curiosity and interest, uh, but uh, hopefully you guys get something out of it too. And speaking of, today we are sitting down with Emily from the Micro Four Nerds YouTube channel. Uh, welcome, Emily, to the show, I guess. Hi, yes, as a, as a fan of, of a play on words, I really like Micro Four Talks as well. That's good, it's in the same vein as Micro Four Nerds, I like it. Yeah, I hope you, you know, I never thought about it until just this instance, but, uh, you know, hopefully you don't think I'm uh, encroaching on your territory or anything like that. No, no, not at all. There's, there's more, more puns, the better. <laughs> honestly, uh, but uh, you honestly, I think, have one of the best YouTube channel names. It's just like right to the point. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's great. I I actually yeah I really am proud of the name I've I've totally peaked I just I can't think of anything better after that <laughs> it's like that that's the one thing. <laughs> no, I guess to introduce you a little bit more, you don't just do YouTube. You're a uh, photographer, videographer, kind of an epic drummer. I think kind oh, of subtly you. in the background and uh, <laughs> a lot more things. I'm sure. So yeah, so so. Uh, all of all of the different income streams. It's all around my camera. So I just kind of say, have a camera and try and do my best with it. So I've got wedding photography and videography. I've got corporate videography and photography. I have my YouTube channel and, and different things like that. And I've recently got into videoing and photographing aerial and circus performers, like fire dancers and stuff. It's been well good fun. You know, maybe we'll have you back on for some of those other avenues. But today I really wanted to talk about, I guess, mostly weddings, because I think it's a, a really good source of income. It's good practice for a lot of different types of videography and photography. Um, and just talk about specifically using Panasonic cameras and Micro Four Thirds cameras specifically for wedding filmmaking. So I guess before we jump into that topic full sail, I don't know if I've ever like heard the story of how you got into Micro Four Thirds and Panasonic uh, in the first place. So what was your first kind of experience hearing about Panasonic and I guess what made you end up going that direction in the first place? So it, it is it is weird. I used to be Sony obsessed and they are brilliant cameras. I'm not bashing any other brands here. And I originally had the original Sony A7 and oh, it. it you know, it's not a, sh a shadow on what it's become now. You know, the battery life was terrible. It was just, it was not a great camera. And I ended up coveting the Olympus Pen F because um, I like how small the lenses were and I liked how tactile it looked. It's like a proper vintage throwback kind of camera. And then as my second camera, once I had the Pen F, I found a Lumix G7 for £200 on display. And I thought, ah! What's the worst that could happen? And then the G7 just took over my life. And I'm just like, where has the Panasonic and Lumix brand been my whole life? The menus made sense to me. Everything was just wonderful. And they just seemed ridiculously good value for money as well. So I think it was a couple of months before I, I sold my Pen F and then jumped in with both feet on my GH5. And the rest is history. <laughs> So around what time would that have been, like 2017, 18 it was, era? It's, it's funny that you asked that. I'm editing a video today that's called a Love Letter to My GH5, and I found the very first day that I got the GH5, which was May 2017. So it's been over five years now within the, the Lumix system. And, uh, yeah, it's been really fun looking back on all the footage and how I've progressed. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I uh, When I 
first started getting into Panasonic and Micro Four Thirds, I was coming from Canon actually back in like maybe 2014, 15, maybe 2016. And I almost was a Sony user myself, but um, I was looking into all this stuff and researching. And this was back when Sony wasn't quite as good as they are today in terms of like the colors and, you know, not overheating and stuff like that. Um, and I really was so torn, like 50-50. I saw a comment on one of the chains I made, which is basically like, if you want the best low light, go Sony. If you want everything else, go Panasonic. And I said, well, that's a pretty good summary. So I went with Panasonic and uh, here we both are. So, uh, and then how did you end up starting to do weddings on with Panasonic? And what do you think Panasonic brings to the table when it comes to wedding videographers? So I guess if you could narrow it down, what's like some of the stuff you think Panasonic really brings to the table for someone wanting to get into wedding videos? So I started with the GH5 and now the GH6 and the S5. And just the absolute bulletproof reliability. It's absolutely ridiculous. Like my GH5 has been through the ringer. And even, um, you know, in the UK a couple of weeks ago, we had sort of the hottest day on record. It was 40 degrees. It was evil. And around that time, I had an outdoor wedding <laughs> for my sins. And I was looking at my cameras. I'm like, right, I'm going to put the GH5 on the balcony in the midday sun. And I just know it's not going to overheat. It's going to do the job and it's going to get the back angle absolutely fine because they're just so blooming reliable. And I think the in-body in -body, stabilization as well is so good because... I kind of like, I have a bit of, of a, a wedding day on a gimbal and I'll have a bit on tripods, but most of the time, if I can help it, I like to be handheld and in the action and, and just sort of having uh, the in-body stabilisation smooth enough where you can create faux dolly shots or slider shots handheld is just so, so useful for me. Uh, and for all of the fellow Americans out there, 40 Celsius is 104 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, so... Just wanted to jump in there and oh, say good. that for because yeah. I, I, I looked hot, it up right? real quick. It's, it's, it's hot for the UK. It's probably not for anywhere else, but it's really hot for the UK. That is very hot. I mean, yeah, I, the heat is definitely a real thing. And uh, I think reliability is one of the most important things for me with the Panasonic Lumix cameras as well. I mean, they're weather sealed. If it's freezing, if it's cold, if it's sprinkling rain or if it's over 100 degrees or over 40 degrees Celsius, I should say. Um, they just keep going. And I, I've never had any issues with my Panasonic cameras when it comes to that overheating. Um, I mean, I, I mean, they're built solid and that's just something I really value. Definitely. And I like the security of your dual SD slots as well on the GH5 and then you've got dual slots on the GH6, but we are waiting for our SSD update, which I'm desperate for. Um, but yeah, I've, I've never had anything go corrupt or anything. I just think it's kind of like I know the cameras inside out. I know they're very easy to use. I know they're very high quality, so I can just get on with whatever else I have to think about and the camera just doesn't get in the way of it. And, and I think there's a lot of things you have to think about in a wedding. So just having the camera do its job and not having to worry about it is so important. And I think you saying like you can do all this stuff with the image stabilization, you switch over to manual focus, rely on the autofocus for certain things. And you know when you can and can't rely on the autofocus, when you can and can't rely on the internal uh, stabilization. I think in uh, media division i don't know if you're aware of them but they did a whole review on the gh6 and uh, one thing that he kept saying was like does it replace a slider does it replace a gimbal does it replace the autofocus replace of a focus puller no not really but it lets you get away with it when you aren't having the time or the resources to do those things and i think that's really the thing with with lumix for me is it just gives you just an edge up on so many areas that you can really do so much with it without bringing on all those other things or if you don't have the time to do it. And with weddings, the camera getting out of your way and letting you just get to work and, you know, film it when you don't have that time 
is really important. It really is. I mean, I, I often say that wedding photography and videography is is a culmination of all different types of genres. You know, certain aspects feel like it's a sporting event because you only get one one opportunity to get the first kiss or the the first moment of this. And, and sometimes it's like uh, being paparazzi in a way, trying to find all the candid moments. And then, you know, you've got to have your cinematic moments and your establishing shots. I, th I think it takes so many different skill sets to do it all effectively. And especially like with you, you go into the photography side as well. And then you have to be, you know, kind of this social butterfly and talking to people and uh, all this sort of stuff. And so you have to have a great technical knowledge but again more for photo than video but for video too some social skills definitely really helps because if you're the videographer you've got to at least talk to the photographer and the dj if you want the best results and if you're the photographer you're interacting with people all day long Mm -hmm. And they're often responsible for the prompts that get the couple looking amazing. As a videographer, I'm very happy to let the photographer do their thing and just sort of shadow what they do and then add in a couple of prompts of my own uh, that are more more applicable to video, like hand-holding hand and walking towards the camera and things that just work better in motion. Um, but most of the time, I leave the prompting up to the photographer. So, yeah, that's that's a fun job when I'm doing that. <laughs> You know, there's some videographers that are super hands on and take as much time as the photographers. But to me, I feel like you get into some diminishing returns there, because if I see something a photographer is doing and I think there could be a version of that that for video, I'll either get it at the same time or I'll just step in real quick, say, hold that. Let me grab this for video, give them a little instruction and then back back off, because I know that not every wedding day has 12 hours and like four hours dedicated to photos and two of them, which can be taken by video doing this whole production. You know, it's sometimes it really is just get in, get what you can get and call it a day. And if you're like we talked about balancing a gimbal or setting up your follow focus or doing all this stuff um, and missing those moments, you know, the gimbal kind of doesn't matter if you're not ready to get that shot, which is. You know, I use a gimbal a lot on the wedding day, don't get me wrong, but I feel like I sort of build up and tear down my camera over the course of a wedding day where I'm starting handheld, I'm adding stuff on, I'm getting bigger lenses in the middle, I've got the gimbal all day, and then by the end I'm back handheld on the dance floor. That's so interesting. I guess there might be a little bit of um, like a different schedule in terms of US weddings versus UK, but I tend to be handheld for the morning prep and then have my gimbal out for the couple portraits and, and the cocktail hour, and then handheld, just picking off people as candidly as possible. And then I do use my gimbal for the first dance at the end. I, I love orbiting around at the end. I think it looks so pretty. Yeah, I, I definitely um, will we'll tell the photographer, like, hey, I'm going to do a 360 at the beginning, and then, and then afterwards get out of the we'll way. be good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like yeah, I'm not going to just keep 316 for the entire dance, so... <laughs> Yeah, I, I was a photographer a weekend ago and the videographer who I'd never worked with before, naming no names, was on a gimbal, but he was literally like three feet away from the bride and just stood still and, and, and like filmed her as she was dancing. And I'm just like, you're in every single shot of mine and you're in your other camera angle because he had a tripod opposite himself. <laughs> and I'm just like, what are you doing, buddy? <laughs> yeah, it, you got to be courteous to you the do. other people, you know. Um, that's why I always try to touch base with whoever else is working um, the day of, whether it's a second shooter that's working with me for video or the photographer, even the DJ, like, or the people at the venue. Um, just what can I do to help you guys out to get stay out of your way? Because at the end of the day, we're, we should all be on the same team. But Yeah, uh, yeah you I'm all want the best for the couple, don't you, at the end of the day, hopefully. And so I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you doing photos and videos. Um, you're using all Lumix, Panasonic stuff for that. Um, do, is that usually a, one or the other thing? Or are you are you going absolutely crazy and doing photo and video on the same day? Because I've done that once before, and I don't recommend it's, anybody try to do photos no. and videos at the same time if you can absolutely avoid it. It's not fun, it's evil, and I hate it. So 90% of the time I try to do one or the other. But occasionally, 
I have to do a little bit of both because I work primarily with a, a male photographer, a, a guy called Martin, who's lovely. So I end up doing bridal prep and he ends up being with, with the groom, assuming it's the same sex wedding. So I end up doing photography and videography in the morning with the bride. He does it with the groom. And then for the rest of the day, I switch and just do videography. Um, so it's just a little bit of juggling in the morning, but there's usually enough time. But actually properly hybrid shooting where you are switching between the two is just a nightmare and it, you go slowly insane. <laughs> and, you know, you have to pick one or the other. So something is always sacrificed. You know, you can't have photography and the video of the confetti shot if you if there's only one of you. So, yeah, I don't recommend it at all. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely, again, don't recommend it. But hey. A lot of cameras do really great photo and video these days, and so Panasonic, I think, is just as capable as any for doing photo. I think Panasonic's actually pretty underrated for photography, um, just in terms, because, you know, we all know that contrast-based is not the best for video, but for photos, I've really never had any major issues outside of extreme backlight or anything like that, so I guess... Can you tell us a little bit about your process for photography with the Lumix cameras? Because uh, that's not something I see people talking about nearly as much as the video side, for good reason, but... Yeah, uh, so I have an S5 and a GH6. So when I'm doing a, a full videography day for a wedding, my GH6 will be camera one, and then I'll, I'll have my S5 as a backup or a secondary angle. And then when I do a photography day, I switch. So my S5 is my primary camera, and I tend to shoot uh, my Sigma 85 1.4 for like as much of the day as I can get away with. And then my GH6 is my backup camera. And in terms of the color science and low light performance and focus, you absolutely cannot tell which camera anything came from. The only difference really comes from uh, the, the the very extreme shallow depth of field in the S5, which is why I tend to gravitate towards that for photography more. For video, I don't see full frame versus micro four thirds versus APS-C really being relevant to at least what I do. But I think photography, you end up with a few more advantages, theoretically at least, uh, for the full frame stuff. But, uh, you know, we might uh, save some more of those discussions for uh, a a part two on this uh, on this, which will be on your channel, I believe. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very much looking forward to that, and for video for the S5 as well. I must say, ninety percent of the wedding I'm shooting in sixty p, which is APS C anyway, <laughs> so it's very similar in terms of sensor size to micro four thirds when you think about it. Exactly, and uh, you know. I guess that we, I might talk about settings just a little bit. Um, what's your process generally in terms of weddings? You know, 4K versus 1080. Are you shooting 60 uh, or 50 or, you know, some kind of higher frame rate throughout the day? Um, what generally, I guess, is your, your process for video on weddings? Yeah, so if my, my, my sort of rule of thumb is, is, if it's if it's got important audio, so if it's ceremony or speeches, or if if we're reading letters in the morning, then it's all twenty four p, which is what I use. But then anything that may be used sort of as as part of the highlight film, all the candid moments, etc., is sixty p. And then I'll I'll whack out the one twenty p on the GH six for say the confetti shot, or if there's um, throwing of the bouquet or anything like that. But most of the time it will be 60p throughout a day what about you is that similar to what you do yeah definitely um i'm i'm almost probably shooting more 60p than you um for the i definitely have been sometimes i forget but hopefully most of the time in theory i'll switch to 24 to you know during the ceremony just because you want that audio to sync up perfectly and everything like that but um yeah, I, I find for the first dance and things like that, I think the 60p is still important for some of those moments. Um, and the the individual things that are happening are generally a little bit shorter, um, like a first dance or a couple speeches is generally shorter than a full ceremony. And so I'll just leave it in 60 and kind of 
fingers crossed. I uh, hope the audio syncs up pretty well because it's really, for me and my experience, the drift for that audio is like a long term thing if you're recording more than like. I don't want to put a number on it, but like 30 minutes plus. It's not plus. the end of the world, is it? If, if you forget and leave it in 60p, it's absolutely not the end of the world. It's it's usually fine. Um, at one thing going from the GH5 to the GH6 was in the, the evening stuff. I, want, I, I was kind of forced into shooting 30p, so I only had sort of, you know, I could do it to 80% speed just to help with the low light performance. But now with the GH6, it's just like pfft, 60p, that's fine. <laughs> and you know... Something that, this is again, not super technically correct, but something I do a lot is I look at my 60p footage and I say, first off, if it's in 60 frames a second, there's a good chance a lot of it's going to be in, like conformed to normal speed 24 frames a second, which if you did that, technically your shutter speed should be a little closer to 150th. Um, so I kind of think in my mind, if my shutter speed's anywhere from 80 to 100, if I have to, it's not the end of the world because I think the effect is more important and the exposure is more important than like perfect motion blur, right? Yeah, so true. Yeah, and, and in the UK, because our electricity is sort of 50 hertz, you have to do it at 1 100th anyway rather than 1 1 25th or 1 50th. Uh, or you'll get flicker, which is really annoying. <laughs> so yeah, you definitely can. You can knock it down a little bit and still get great results. Yeah, if you're, you know, if you're shooting, I mean, I've shot 60 FPS at 1 60th before, and it definitely looks a little too sm smooth of motion blur for sure, but it's not that bad. If you shot like 24 frames at 1 25th, that's going to look really off because it's normal motion. But the higher frame rates you go, the less shutter speed matters, in my opinion. So, you know, just kind of, I think for everyone out there, test your own stuff out, see what works for you and what's in that acceptable range. Um, I guess I do have one question, which is not exactly Panasonic related, but there's kind of a debate in the wedding world, which is um, cranking the shutter versus using ND filters. Uh, do you have any strong feelings on this? So I I am squarely in the middle of this debate because I have a two to five stop variable ND with a, a little bit of mist in it, which is really nice. And sometimes if the five stops isn't enough, I'll crank my shutter a bit. But I think that's a heck of a lot better than just not having an ND at all and really cranking the shutter. So I'm not a purist, but I, I do use NDs, but I'm not like dialed into the second unless there's electricity and flicker that I have to deal with. And then I will. Okay. Sure. Yeah. For me, I, I'm a, I'm probably the same as you, because obviously getting an exposure, correct exposure is the most important thing. And in a fast paced environment, you got to do what you got to do. But there's some people that just say, I leave my ND at home because the clients don't care and they don't really notice. But I've had clients that have noticed. So <laughs> they're just like, they don't have the words for it. They just say, wow, you shoot really fast or this looks really fast or something. It looks like but, you're shooting on a GoPro. <laughs> and that's the thing with me. I think everything with filmmaking is associations. You know, what do we associate with... Uh, large sensors or film or film versus video or film versus your iPhone. And I think that really high, like one eight thousandth shutter speed kind of look feels like a phone or feels like a GoPro. Uh, and so I think that is an important thing to make things look natural and look cinematic, which are two things I want my weddings to look like. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think there's definitely a little bit of wiggle room in, you know, in your fast paced environment. You can't always get everything perfect. But yeah, I, I do think sort of getting the shutter speed in the ballpark, because there's nothing worse than when something's close to frame and you just see that that motion where you can just see everything crystal clear with no motion blur. It stresses me out. <laughs> Yeah, definitely in, in cloudy England, uh, heat wave aside, the two to five is usually fine. And I do love that it has a, a little bit of mist in it as well. I think uh, I, I really like how that softens uh, skin tones and 
you know, if you're shooting against highlights, it can really make it look very pleasing. No, 100%. And I, I go back and forth a little bit just because I don't know if the mist works for every uh, studio, wedding studio I work for. But for my own personal weddings that I do, um, that I'm going to be editing, I know how I'm going to edit them. I'll definitely push the style a little bit more, use some quirkier lenses, use some mist filters and things like that. But if I'm associate shooting for a company, I'm like, you okay. got to play it safe, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I can't just be doing crazy stuff all day and doing all these things when an editor is going to have to make sense of it at the end of the day. Um, I'm just going to try to be as consistent as possible, know when I can be creative and hope that they understand what I'm going for. And then also know when it's time to just be consistent, get the shot and call it a day. Oh, for sure. And as you said before, where you, you get other people to edit your videos, I'm leaning more towards that with my photography at the moment. This year, I've done a heck of a lot of associate shooting for different uh, photography companies. And it, it's, it's so refreshing to just go and do the job and then hand off your footage at the end of the day and it's like, oh, I don't have an editing queue of 5,000 weddings. <laughs> it's so nice to just be done at the end of the day. And you're right, you do have to play it safer because you know, you, you don't know who's going to be editing it or what their preferences are at the end of the day. The reason I got the first two or three studios and interested in me and moving to Chicago was one, I had a good reel. So if you guys are starting out doing weddings, anybody out there, um, no matter what system you use, I think it's important to maybe tag along as a second shooter, find someone where you're going to be able to use that footage in a reel and just have some kind of example of your work. Um, I know I shot a wedding, I think, for my cousin back in like, you know, when I was like 15 or 16. And, you know, almost everything I've done since has come from that. But you need some example of your work. But uh, for me, the two people I started working with originally was um, guys that used Panasonic already. And I was able to talk to them about the cameras and how they worked and show that I knew what I was doing. Um, just from a conversational standpoint. And so I'm not going to say your Panasonic camera is going to get you all these wedding jobs specifically, but that is how it worked out for me. It can be so helpful. I mean, so sometimes, you know, it, it, when you pick up another branded camera that you're not used to, whether it's a Sony or a Canon or whatever, it's just like you feel almost like a, like a new videographer again because you don't know where all the bits and bobs are so having the same system as whoever you're going to work with can be very very useful i forced my uh forced my photography partner martin to get the s5 so that we could share lenses and the colors would grade together and yeah i'll just brainwash everyone i know into lumix i'm afraid <laughs> that's how i feel as well but i mean for my own personal collection i think i mentioned this to you before uh, I don't know if it was before we started or since we hit the, we started rolling on these cameras, but I briefly owned the ZV-1 for a while, which was a, a fun little camera, but I just could never get the colors to match where I wanted to uh, between those camera brands. And maybe that was a little bit user error. Maybe if I was more experienced with Sony, I could find something that worked. And I found some luck with like Canon matching Panasonic more than Sony, but Again, that could have just been the shooters I was working with or my own skill. But it's really nice to have three to five cameras all from one manufacturer, all with similar colors, whether you're going to be in natural or vlog or whatever it is. Especially in like a multi-camera situation when you're in the same space with the same lighting. It's so apparent when you switch from like one camera to another in certain situations. Yeah, it really is. I mean, for my multicam setup, they're all Lumix, thankfully, so they do um, they do work together really well. So I have my GH6, my GH5, my S5, and then if I really desperately need a fourth angle, like a balcony angle or something, I dust off my G7. <laughs> so oh, yeah. you still got it. Yeah, yeah, um, and it's annoying because that one doesn't do vlog, so it only shoots in Cine Light D. But I have a lot that can convert Cine Light D vaguely into vlog so i can make it work in the edit there you go yeah my my current setup is gh6 gh5 mark ii um s5 
And then if I get down to the dredges, it's it's GH4 and my little G100, which honestly I bought mostly because of your coverage and one other video that I was like, I might have misjudged this camera at the beginning. I mean, it's not a great game changing camera or anything, but it saved me a lot in certain wedding situations or filmmaking situations for sure. Do you know, I have a G100 and I don't think I've ever used it for a wedding. I just always go to my G7 for some reason, but the G the G100 would be absolutely as good and does have vlog. <laughs> yeah, I love my G100. I think it's um, great, particularly for photography and, and sort of travel because it's so tiny. And yeah, it's great. If you just need another angle for something for your videos, it's such a good camera. Oh, I actually have mine right here. I guess I'll show it on camera. Look at my show and tell. Will it focus on it though with the mode I'm in? Probably not. I'll just hold it next to me. But yeah, I've got the G100 with the 14 to 140 uh, Panasonic lens, which I always kind of look down on because it was such a super zoom type of lens. But I've been using this a lot for weddings actually, where it's like maybe I want a wide shot at the beginning and then punch into a close up halfway through. And having a 28 to 280 zoom is kind of ridiculous. ridiculous. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. I gravitate towards the 24 to 105 on my S5 for that reason. Just having such a, 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 a scope of, of, of the focal lengths is so good. And it is only F4, but I think the payoff and, and being able to punch in and have the macro capability with that lens is so good. Yeah, I... I unfortunately sold my 24 to 105 and I miss it, but I couldn't justify having a 24 to 70 and a 24 to 105. So. No. Did you go Lumix or Sigma for your F 2.8 stock? Yes, I got, I got the, the Lumix version. Just Very nice. I just, you know, I'm such a Lumix guy and I want the colors to match, the character to match. And I this is how I justified it. I was like, the Sigma isn't as good in manual focus and it isn't as good in autofocus. So those are important things to me. So I wanted the best experience in both of those situations. Plus I got one for like 1600 instead of 2300 new. I think I might have even paid 1500 American for it. So uh, I just had to jump on it when I saw that because I was like, that's the lowest I've ever, one of the lowest prices I've ever seen that lens go for so yeah i uh i've tried the sigma stock martin has it as his main um stock lens and it really stresses me out that the zoom on the sigmas goes in the opposite direction so i always zoom in and out in the wrong way it's fine on the primes obviously but it really trips me up on the on the, the stock lens <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's the same reason I could never quite get into Olympus lenses for micro four thirds was the backwards zoom, or at least from my perspective. Um, yeah, I bet everyone thinks we're backwards. <laughs> yeah, but it does. It just feels wrong, doesn't it? So yeah, I'm sure we could talk about this topic all day. We could probably do an entire series on wedding stuff, which I mean, who knows? Maybe, um, probably not. We'll see. But thanks for stopping by and talking wedding filmmaking, specifically with the Panasonic cameras. Um, I think there's some really good information in there. And who knows? Maybe we can talk about weddings a little bit more someday. But I really want to thank you for stopping by the channel and, and chatting with us. Yeah, it's been lovely. I'm always happy to chat about weddings. I think on my channel, I, I don't think it's necessarily a wedding videography or photography channel. I like to dip into it occasionally, but I think um, having an avenue to chat with you about more in-depth stuff is so useful. For sure. And I'm, I'm glad we were able to both get into that a little bit more than we would be able to on our own on in, in the individual video about that sort of topic. So if you want to see part two of this conversation where we talk about a little bit more in depth of the mixing of formats inside Panasonic versus, you know, the full frame versus the micro four thirds, whether you should commit to one, maybe you should diversify and everything in between, definitely go over to Emily's channel, micro four nerds and check that out. That should, you know, we'll see how we time it, but hopefully we release them at the same time and it's a nice seamless transition. Uh, before I let you go and we get on to part two, Emily, I want to 
ask you one thing, which is, uh, is there anything you want to kind of promote or put out there for people who are interested in your work or your channels or anything like that? Any projects? You know, the floor is yours to uh, promote Ooh. yourself. It's a good question. I like that question. So I get quite a lot of comments about how I edit my photographs and I direct people to microphonenerds.com because I have lots of different preset sales on and, and different packs. And the other thing that I did uh, earlier last year was doing an astrophotography for beginners course, which is also on my website. Uh, it's it's dead cheap and it's sort of a good few hours of content. And it's just if you're an absolute beginner and want to get into it, you know, it's a really good way to learn that perhaps YouTube videos don't go into in that much depth. You, have a, you run a Facebook page, I believe, uh, which I think has one of the better, if not the best, Panasonic community on oh, it. Oh, yeah. Um, That's to toot my own horn. It's the biggest independently run uh, Facebook group for Lumix and Olympus. So the only ones bigger than our group is the official ones of each, which I think is really cool. Wow. I did not know that. But yeah, it's... It's a very impressive community you've gathered there, and uh, I really enjoy being a part of it. And uh, then, yeah, the website as well for everything else that you have to offer. Definitely check that out. And uh, I might be getting some tips on you on, on how to run a website because uh, I haven't done it for years out of pure laziness. But, yeah, definitely check all those links out. I'll, if I did my job right, they'll be in the description. <laughs> Otherwise, if you Google Micro Four Nerds, all that stuff should pop up right away. So, anyway, thank you again so much, and we'll see everybody for part two, which is Lumix full frame versus micro four thirds. I mean, it's not that dramatic, but you know, <laughs> gotta play up the drama for the, uh, the clicks, you know what I mean? So.